brought to you by Local Video Magnum. Welcome to day two of my video series. Today is the letter B, and B is, you guessed it, for bananas. Bananas are a good source of potassium, vitamin B6, and vitamin C. Potassium is great for your skater's muscles. Vitamin B6 is actually stored in the muscle tissue and helps your skater's muscle have more energy during practice. That's why you see a lot of bananas at the rink and vitamin C is excellent for helping your skater heal after they get cut. One thing that I like to do in my house is I like to freeze my bananas so when they're starting to get a little bit brown or the color that you wouldn't want to eat um, raw, I slice them, place them on a baking sheet and freeze them and when they're good and solid I put them in a Ziploc bag so that later on I can use them in a smoothie and the frozen bananas give an ice cream consistency without having to add ice cream. So add bananas to your grocery shopping list and help your child be fast and powerful. Controlling the ball is one of the most important floorball skills. The player controlling the ball, without being taken on by an opponent, does not need to focus on the ball and can assess the play situation. He provides his teammates time to find space and provide an option for playing. He determines the game tempo and can bring his teammates into play by passing them the ball. In play, the opponents can attack from many angles, narrowing the playing space. Under pressure from opponents, it's necessary to have a variety of dribbling techniques to keep the ball. One-handed or two-handed ball carrying depends on the play situation. The one-handed grip is suitable to advance the ball in a fast break situation. The two-handed grip is used close to the body to protect the ball, carry the ball, pass or shoot. I snapped this photo in the summer of 1979. Actually, 
I stumbled across this seemingly secret training session one day as I roamed the expansive maze of corridors in the Moscow Institute for Sport and Physical Culture. What's going on here is that the overhead cable and harness arrangement is lifting the sprinter so that he weighs less than normal and so that he can run an awful lot faster than under normal conditions. This in mind, let me share an example that I often use to break this point. Consider the act of running up a hill. A runner is working against gravity here, challenging his leg strength and his conditioning. However, what you might not have considered is the fact that this sort of training is also teaching the runner's body to work slower than if he was running on a flat surface. Now, let's compare that with a runner moving down an incline. You know the feeling. With gravity sucking you down the hill, there's almost a fear of losing control. For, under such circumstances, the runner is actually running faster than if he was on level ground. And, this is a fairly good example of overspeed work in that the athlete is being assisted in the movement. In his body, and all of its neuromuscular signaling devices, are being familiarized with a faster pace. As a sidebar here, appreciate that some negative influences, like slowness or poor mechanics, can come about from the wearing of heavy, bulky, or tight gear. That's why I like to reduce the amount of equipment or clothing my players wear anytime I want them to work on quickness or speed. Now, overspeed drill methods can be pretty varied, but they almost always have a common approach in that a movement is assisted in order to help the player to move faster than usual. Here's another idea I brought back from Moscow. A number of things are going on, but you should see how the movement is being aided as this young hockey player attempts to use the ball in order to jump as high as possible. And I'll suggest that there's at least a slight overspeed component to hopping on this mini trampoline since that springy gadget greatly aids my students' movements. One way I've found to assist crossovers is through the use of centrifugal force. Of course, as with almost all of these exercises, there's some danger involved as players take turns whipping one another around at a near frightening pace. Then, for even more ideas, I might suggest looking at the numerous ways movements are traditionally resisted so as to bring about strength gains. For, if you just reverse most of those drills or the training devices, you'll likely get the opposite overspeed effect. For example, bungees can be reversed thereby helping the player to take off faster than he would under typical circumstances. And this slingshot effect can be gained in a number of different ways, as well as in a number of different training venues. I believe there's also an overspeed benefit to this one. Here, my guys are initially being resisted by their partner. However, after just a few seconds, the partner lets go, allowing the skater to bust out at a fairly good clip. Of course, some elite level athletes have also used various mechanized devices in pursuit of speed. So, while I'm not recommending any of these, I guess it's necessary for me to at least point out the use of automobiles, motorized cable systems, and fast-spinning treadmills as yet other means of training 
at a faster than normal pace. Finally, although everything I've described to this point primarily involves some sort of unique physical challenge, I'm going to suggest that there is a huge mental side to speed training. Think back, if you will, to what it feels like to run down a hill. Think also about what it might be like to experience the various ways I've described to propel someone beyond their usual capacity. Four, then you might understand why I'm constantly talking to my players about going beyond their comfort zones or about pushing the envelope. Yeah, I truly believe that overcoming the fear factor in moving at a new speed plays a major role in actually achieving it. Beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. 
Now, here's a research study. I want to be like Pierre Paget. So I, I did a study like Pierre Paget. Uh, so I, for 12 years, I was the skating coach and the physiologist for the University of Alberta women's hockey team. So they are based in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. A, a, a really, really good hockey team. Out of 12 years, they won the national championship in Canada six times. I'm not really sure if it had anything to do with their skating coach, but uh, nevertheless, we collected a lot of data on them. So I wanted to be like Pierre Paget. So I wanted to do a similar study like, uh, like Mr. Paget. So what we did was we wanted to find the differences between fast and slow female hockey players, female hockey players. So we identified the five fastest and the five slowest players on the team. And then we measured them in four ways. We measured them over 44.8 meters. We measured the time of the recovery skate off the ice to the toe was on the ice, and I'll show you these in videos later on. Now, we, we, we actually, it was, this was kind of exciting research because I think we found another skating characteristic, and we called this blade flap to propulsion on the inside edge. We're going to watch this, and we found that this is one of the most significant differences, statistically significantly differently. That's hard to say in English. Yeah, anyway, you get it? Okay, statistically significantly different. Blade flat to propulsion, and I'll, I'll show you what it is. I'll show you here, but then I'll show you in the video. And then total recovery time, so that's the time the toe goes off the ice to the time the, go the toe uh, leaves the ice again. Total recovery time. We, we presented this at the American College of Sports Medicine's annual meetings in 2009, and it was published in a journal called Medicine and Science and Sports Exercise in 2009 as well. And this is what we found. First of all, we had to make sure that the faster players, in fact, were faster players. So over 44 meters, in fact, they were faster. They were faster by 0.77 seconds. Almost three quarters of a second, the faster skaters were faster. And this was statistically significant. Recovery to skate blade toe on the ice. So I'll show you again in the video, but that means from the time their, their toe left the ice to the time their toe landed on the ice. That's the recovery phase. There wasn't a difference here. And we were really surprised by this. There wasn't a difference. Like about a quarter of a second. And it was really interesting to us because we thought that there would, would be a big difference, but there wasn't. Now, this one was important. Okay, so. The player pushes off, the toe is the last thing to leave. Now, I'm not suggesting that they are flicking their toe because fast hockey players do not flick their toe. Fast hockey players do not forcefully plantar flex their toe. Anyway, time their toe leaves the ice to the time their uh, toe lands on the ice and then blade flat. Okay, so that's the recovery. So what we measured was once their blade got flat onto the ice and how long it took for them to start pushing off. How did I do explaining that? Does that make sense? I'll wait for the translator. Does that make sense? Yes? Thank you. Now look at the difference here, ladies and gentlemen. This was huge and we were really excited about this. So I'm a skating coach, but I'm also a research geek. That didn't translate to be funny? Okay, that's all right. Okay. Look at the difference here. 0.07, 0.08, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.19, 0.
to the time the toe lands, blade flat, and then they push off and they finish that whole cycle. They finish that whole cycle. Dennis Chigas Olas, The Nature of Our Game, ranks with other high-level essays, authored by the likes of Gladwell, Percival, and Coyle. It's an in-depth study of our game, it's about the challenges players face in the heat of battle, and it's about the things that influence the way players need to train, both off, and on the ice. Get it now, and be well armed, to answer almost any question, that arises about our game. resistancebandtrain.com. Welcome to the band gym. I have a treat for you today. Are you a runner? Are you a walker? You're definitely a walker. I've got eight attachment free exercises using one band that can help develop not only your walking strength but your running strength. And the cool thing is hook the band around your hips, take it with you on your next run and get a strength run workout in at the same time. Check out these eight exercises. And if you like them, make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel if you enjoy the videos. Look forward to showing you these. Have a great time with them. Welcome to Talking Hockey with John and Howie. I am your host, John Crawford, along with my brother Howie. Howdy, howdy. Here to bring you the latest and greatest on what's going on around the NHL. Howie, how you been? Just working. Yep. Working, working, working. Yep, I hear you. Well, we've had a lot of hockey uh, going on. The season is beginning to wrap up. Yep, just one more week and we are done. Yep, yep. So let's kind of take a look and see what where we stand right now today. 
Um, over in the east, uh, Washington is officially in, um, along with Pittsburgh, who um, won last night, I guess, and they are officially in. Along with Boston, Tampa Bay, and Toronto, all officially in. Um, and then you have Columbus, who's currently sitting in third in the Metropolitan. It looks like they're going to... Yeah, they're going to be bumped as of now since Philadelphia just beat Boston. Right. Yeah, so you have to kind of wait and see what happens there. Um... I don't know, does Columbus play tonight? No, they do not. Mm. But they have uh, Detroit next. So, And that's on the third, so that's a couple days. And then they, yeah. they play Detroit. And then uh, Philadelphia has the Islanders next, also on the third. So let's see what it goes on there. Um, so that's what's going on in the east. Let's go over to the west. Uh, the west, we have Nashville and Winnipeg locking up their spots. Uh, there also Vegas has clinched a playoff spot there, yeah. which leaves uh, Minnesota holding down the third spot right now in the central division at 96 points. Uh, San Jose in second with 98 points in the Pacific, and the Kings holding down third with 94. Your wild cards currently in the West right now are Anaheim and St. Louis, with Colorado right on top of that bubble, uh, yeah. tied with St. Louis actually with 92 points. Right. Right. So anything can happen here. Uh, you have Minnesota playing Edmonton on the second. Yeah, Minnesota's uh, a very tough uh, ending week. They, we do, got, they probably have the toughest with Edmonton being probably Edmonton, the easiest yeah, then they out of on them the road, all. Yeah, then they go on the road to the west to play Anaheim, L.A., and San Jose to yeah, close they've, up. They've got it tough. Uh, those games also will be very important to L.A. Um, they have Colorado next, which will be interesting. Um... And then they have, I think it's Minnesota after that, right? I think. No, we don't play Colorado. No. Oh, L.A. Minnesota, L.A. Yeah. Uh, so very important games. We have Anaheim also playing Colorado uh, today. So that will be interesting to see what happens. And then uh, St. Louis has Washington will be a very tough game for St. Louis. Yeah. Um, and very important. But that's kind of how it's looking right now, and I think we're going to have to wrap it up here, Howie. So we will catch you all up with what's going on next time right here on Talking Hockey with John and Howie. We bid you all adieu. That's what I need. Programming is brought to you by Local Video Marketing.